Well, good morning. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 2, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And we're going to be talking a little bit about dreams today. Uh, isn't it weird how when you have a dream, it, you wake up and it feels real? Have you, ever, have you ever had a dream like that? Like maybe somebody passed away or um, you got in a fight with your spouse. Like there have been times where I've woken up like angry at Angel and I treat her, <laughs> I'll treat her like I'm angry because I'm like, you don't know what you just did to me in this dream, okay? And so uh, I don't know if you've ever felt like that before, but Angel, when we first got married, she was a really weird dreamer. She, uh, she would sleep eat, which was kind of weird. She would wake up and be like, I ate three chocolate bars last night. They're like right there by her bed. She's like, I don't remember eating them. If you, I don't know if you've ever slept eight before, but that's really weird. And they were the mini ones, not like the full ones. But there was this one time, so we're laying there in bed. It's our first year of marriage. And, uh, and she's laying there, and I'm looking over at her, and she's got a smile on her face, and she's just like this. And, and then all of a sudden, she lifts up her hands, and she goes, Woo! You go, girl! <laughs> it took so much energy not to just crack up laughing. And I'm like, this is so weird. What did I get myself into? You know what I mean? But, uh, but dreams can have a real effect on us. And God has communicated with people in the past through dreams and through visions, and that's exactly where we find Nebuchadnezzar. He is really distraught because the dream that he had, as you saw up on the video, is really kind of a traumatic dream. He sees this enormous statue uh, that is made up of different parts, and it ends up getting destroyed, and then this, this gigantic mountain grew. And dreams in the old times and in, in antiquity, it was normal. And they actually would keep records of their dreams, and then they would call in the most intelligent people in the kingdom who would interpret the dreams. And so that's what's happening with Nebuchadnezzar. He's sitting on his throne, he calls in the magicians, he calls in the astrologers, he calls in the uh, people who interpret dreams, anyone that you can think of who's the elitist. And he says, I want you to tell me two things. Number one, what was my dream? And number two, what did it mean? And so if you read down through the first couple verses of Daniel chapter 2, you will see where the magicians will say, okay, tell us what your dream is and we'll be able to interpret you. And what they would do is they would look at the historical record that they had for previous dreams and then they would interpret the current dreams based off of the former dreams that they had access to. But ne King Nebuchadnezzar calls their bluff. He says, no, I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. I want you to tell me what the dream is, and then I want you to interpret it. And they said around eight, verses 8 and 9, who could possibly do this? Only the gods are able to do something like this, was their response. No one is able to tell you what you dreamed about. We don't have access to your mind. And so here King Nebuchadnezzar calls their bluff. He says, you're all going to die. Because you're a bunch of frauds, right? You guys think that you can interpret dreams. You guys claim to have a certain inspiration from the gods. And I'm calling your bluff. You can't tell me what I dreamed about. And you can't tell me what the interpretation is. You're all going to die. And one of the men included in the elite wise men of that time is a guy named Daniel. As well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We met them last week. Only they didn't get called in to meet the king. And so you got this guy named Arioch, who's appointed to carry out these death sentences, and he comes upon Daniel. And so that's where we're going to pick up our story in Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 11. And so we find these people complaining to the king in verse 11, where he says, Moreover, the thing which the king demands is too difficult, and there is no one who could declare it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. And because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men in Babylon. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I watch certain, not all, but certain evangelists on TV uh, or certain charismatic preachers, and they claim to have supernatural gifts, I'm just kind of like, yeah, bogus. <laughs> they'll have somebody come up the aisle, and they'll be miraculously healed. And these people travel around with them, and, it's, and a lot of it is just a really big money scheme that you shouldn't fall for. But not everybody on TV is, is a false prophet or a false teacher, okay? But that's, that's who I think about. I think about these, these scammers, so to speak, who aren't authentic. Anything that 
they say they can do that's powerful or majestic, it really typically can't be verified, for instance. There's no falsification, so to speak. And so these magicians have aggravated the king so much so that he puts them to the test, and they fail. And one of the things that I was thinking about is, you know, when it comes to people claiming divine inspiration or supernatural guidance, or they dreamed a dream that should tell you how to live your own life, or even yourself, Even yourself having a dream. The Bible says that we should put these things to the test. If you look in Jeremiah, for instance, chapter 23, or Deuteronomy chapter 13, one of the penalties for a false prophet, or someone proclaiming that they could dream something, or they could uh, interpret a vision, one of the punishments for a false prophet was death in the Old Testament. And so this is something that we should examine. Are our dreams legitimate? When people proclaim to be speakers and followers of God, even myself, and I'm, I'm proclaiming to be able to teach you the word, do I reflect what the Bible teaches? Am I telling the truth? You see, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether or not they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There are a lot of people who proclaim every Sunday morning from a stage to preach the truth and teach the truth, and they follow the way of God. But when you put them to the test, when you examine what the Bible has to say, they really sometimes don't match up, or they say things that are false. Paul also wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, do not treat prophecies with contempt. The the prophecies that we find in the Bible are, are really good, but test them all and hold on to what is good. And so when it comes to things like dreams and visions and prophecies and even preaching the Bible, we need to say, does it match up with the word of God? Does it make sense? Is it rational? Is it the truth? And so we have to be careful of people who proclaim apostolic authority. Let me give you a perfect example. The Book of Mormon is a book to be proclaimed to be from God. It has over 4,000 scribal errors alone, areas that had the wrong language or the wrong spelling, so to speak. And that doesn't even count the historical inaccuracies or just the the simple logical fallacies that are in it. And this is a book that is supposed to be from God uh, 1,500 years, 1,800 years after Jesus. But when you put it to the test, it fails. There was a man named Charles Taz Russell. He started Jehovah's Witnesses, and he proclaimed to have divine guidance, and he wrote a a seven-volume work on how to interpret certain scriptures. And he actually got called into a court of law, and they asked Charles to interpret or to say the Greek alphabet. The, The Bible was written, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. And so he's sitting in a court of law, and the man is supposed to be a prophet of God, and he can't even recite the Greek alphabet, which is a basic fundamental for understanding what the Bible teaches. Even Christians themselves. I mean, if you go to John chapter 14, for instance, and there Jesus promises his disciples that he's going to send them the, 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 the spirit, the comforter, some translation has. But really, the, it's called a script writer. And he will guide you into all truth. In fact, the apostles said, we won't even have to remember what Jesus said because the spirit is going to be able to teach us. And even Christians today who use that text to apply it to themselves for divine inspiration, need to be tested. For someone to claim that they are an apostle today means that they need to do the works of an apostle. And so here you have King Nebuchadnezzar doing what many of us should do, putting people to the test. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, Paul warns people, there are false apostles deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then that if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. And so we have to be on guard. I don't care if it's me. I don't care if it's somebody on TV. I don't care if it's your best friend who you've known for dozens of years. If it doesn't match up with what the Bible teaches, then we should throw it out. Get rid of it. Put it to the test. And so that's exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar does. And unfortunately, they fail. Now here we have Daniel, who is a true man of God, who's actually been given the gift to interpret dreams and visions supernaturally by God. And here comes this guy, Arioch, in Daniel chapter 2, starting at verse 14. It says, Then Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He said to Arioch, the king's commander, 
For what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch informed Daniel about this matter. And so Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Daniel says, look, I'm a man of God. God has given me this ability, but I need time. I want time to pray. Daniel says, I don't want my head to be cut off. I don't want to be lumped in with these false prophets and these false apostles. I know that God can work through me, but I need to pray. And so he approaches God in humility, starting in verse 17. It says, then Daniel went to his house and informed his, fran- his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which are the Hebrew names for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it says, so they might request compassion from God concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He he removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise men and knowledge to the men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He who knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells within him. To you, O God, my fathers, I give thanks and praise. Thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you, and for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, and he went and spoke to him as follows, Do not kill us. Don't destroy us. Take me to the king's presence. And I will declare the interpretation to the king. This is what I love about Daniel, right? He goes to his prayer closet, but it is not a passive prayer. It is a proactive prayer. He doesn't just sit back and say, well, we're going to pray about it. It's like when uh, a natural disaster happens or a terrorist attack and everybody gets on social media sending up our prayers, which is a good thing. There is power in prayer. We must always start with prayer, but to then not do anything about it to not help out, to not serve, to give thanks with no action and no service is a deficiency in our Christianity and it's a deficiency in our service to the world. You see, God wants us to be prayer warriors, but he also wants us to be proactive Christians. Don't just sit back and pray. Give thanks and serve. Give thanks and serve. Pray and produce. And that's exactly what Daniel does here. He gives thanks. He says, God, I thank you. You're the one who has given me wisdom. You're the one who has given me power. And so he gives thanks in his prayer. And then he says, I'm going to go before the king and I'm going to serve. I'm going to go do something about it. And you know, we as Christians, the Bible says in James chapter 1 verses 5, that if anybody lacks wisdom, if there's wisdom that you don't have, you should ask God for it. God, give me wisdom. Give me understanding. But think about it. What is wisdom? Is wisdom just knowledge? Absolutely not. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. It is skillful living. That's what, that's what wisdom is. And sometimes getting wise comes at a great cost, doesn't it? I mean, think about the majority of people in this room, those of you who are older, uh, maybe in your 50s or 60s and 70s, 80s on up, you have great wisdom because you have experienced a lot in your life right? Amen? I mean, there are things that you have gone through, uh, relationships that you've had that have come and gone, situations that you've been in, experiences that you've had, skills that you've learned, and so you're able to look back at your past, and you're able to give wisdom to people who come seek it from you. Hey, tell me what I do. I'm not really sure how to handle this, or what's the best way to look at this situation? And so we ask God for wisdom, and we give him thanks for it. But wisdom typically doesn't come through a supernatural bolt from God. In fact, I would argue it doesn't come that way at all. Wisdom comes from life experience. You and I are not like Daniel. And I wish, wouldn't that be cool to have knowledge right from God? But we're not like that. And so when we ask God for wisdom, sometimes it comes through reading our word or asking a fellow Christian how you should handle something or researching and writing and reading and asking God, God, help place these people in my life so that I can learn. And that's is what Daniel does. He's surrounded by people of the same faith. 
He is pursuing education. He is having the greatest training that you could ever have. But most importantly, God is on his side. And so look at verse 21. God gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to who? What type of people? Those who are learning, those who are searching. And so God wants us to be proactive in our prayer life. God wants us to seek him out. And so God wants us to give thanks and praise to him, but also serve. And I'm going to say that over and over again, because that's what I want you to walk away with. Giving thanks and serving. Giving thanks and serving. And in verse 25, we've got Daniel, who actually goes to Arioch. He's like, look, man, put me to the test. I'll go before the king. I know that my head could roll because of this, but I've got God on my side. And in verse 25, we find the story. Then Arioch uh, brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. Of course, he takes credit. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. Then Daniel said, whose name was also Belshazzar, that was his his, uh, name that he received in Babylon. Are you able to make known to me, this is uh, the king speaking to Daniel, the dream which I have seen in this interpretation? I don't believe you. I've seen enough wise men. I've heard enough storytellers. I don't buy this garbage. You guys have failed every time. I don't believe it. I mean, you can see this doubt here in his his statement. And Daniel answered before the king, As for the mystery which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor uh, diviners were able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he is able to make known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. Notice that phrase, latter days, last days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. As for you, O king, while you were on your bed, your thoughts turned to what would take place in the future, and he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. Now hold on a second. Are we talking about the future from today forward? Absolutely not. One of the worst things that you can do is read something in the Bible that talks about the future and apply it to yourself. So let's all put ourselves in the spot of King Nebuchadnezzar in 600 BC and let's look forward to the future here, okay? Into what will take place. He says in verse 30, But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me. That's what I love about Daniel. He gives thanks and he serves. He gives thanks and he serves, but God gets the credit. He is so humble. This guy is probably 10 times more holier. He's definitely 10 times hotter. We read that last week, right? He's a good looking guy. Remember I said it's like looking in a mirror? You guys remember that one? And so he's he's a good looking guy and he's smart. And at the end of the day, he says, look, this isn't me. This is God. He is humble. And he says, more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king, that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. And so he approaches the king in humility. Now the last days is a really cool subject in the Bible, but a lot of people, they get it twisted. The last days started on the day of Pentecost. Whenever you look into the New Testament, for instance, in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Peter says, he talks about the prophecy in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, which says, In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on on all the flesh, and young men will dream dreams, and old men will prophesy. And Peter says, the last days that Joel was talking about, he says, this is that. The last days started there. If you also read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1, it says, God in the former times spoke to us through his son in the last days. His son being Jesus. Jesus spoke to the people of the world in the last days. Well, Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. The last days have been happening for 2,000 years. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 18, the Bible says, Children, it is the last hour. This is another, another phrase. Just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. And so a lot of people are looking for this boogeyman who's going to come and he's going to reign in Jerusalem and he's going to be the Antichrist and a lot of bad stuff is going to happen. That stuff is false. It is not true. It is not what the Bible teaches. There were Antichrists in John's day. There are Antichrists today. It is anyone who denies the deity and the humanity of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
That is an antichrist. So don't get your knickers in a twist. Don't get all bent out of shape thinking that a a future boogeyman is going to come. That is not true. It is not what the Bible teaches. We are living in the last days, and Jesus could come any moment. Lord willing, he could come right now. That would be awesome. Then I could stop preaching, and we would have fun. (laughs) So Daniel says, God showed you what was going to happen in the last days, and he's willing to put himself to the test here. He's willing to put himself up against the soothsayers and the magicians and the conjurers. And then he gives this incredible recap of the dream that you saw in the video. And so there was this huge statue, and there was a a head of gold, and there were chests of silver, and then you had bronze, and then legs of iron, and down at the feet it was mixed with clay. And he goes on to interpret this this dream, which we are going to see. But out of nowhere, you've got this incredible statue. And out of nowhere, here comes this rock as if it was carved without hands. And it comes down and it hits the statue at the weakest point, its feet. And the statue falls. If you know anything about iron and clay, when you try to mix the two together, it doesn't stand. They don't hold. And so it hit the weak point of the statue. And the statue didn't just fall. It was completely annihilated, and this rock turned into a gigantic mountain, and it fulfilled the entire earth. Well, what's it talking about here? What's going on? Why is is he even having this dream? What's the point? Again, in verse 36, look what Daniel says. He says, we will give you the dream. We will give you the interpretation. Daniel is so humble That even though God has given him the gift of interpretation, he still doesn't take credit for himself. And so he goes on to describe this dream, and it's simply this. Look at verse 37. You, O king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory, wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, has given them into your hand, and has caused you to rule over them all. You, king, are the head of gold. Now put this in Daniel's perspective. His nation was just almost destroyed, and a lot of them were taken back to Babylon. He lost his family. He only has a few friends with him. He is enslaved to the king's service. Uh, Daniel has probably had one of the most horrific experiences that you could ever imagine. And he's captive in Babylon. And then he gets this dream. And he says, King Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. And there's going to be a kingdom that comes up after you that's going to be uh, stronger or inferior than you are, but it's going to overtake you. And that is going to be silver, two precious things. And then there's going to be a kingdom of iron, and it is going to control the whole world. And then there's going to be a very strong kingdom of, or excuse me, bronze, and then there's going to be a very strong kingdom of iron. And the iron is going to destroy and take over all the others. Now from a Jew who is captive in Babylon, recognizing that King Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold, but he is not going to live forever. Think of the kind of hope that that would bring to them. Our captivity isn't going to last forever. The temporary rule of these nations, who are strong, who are mighty, can't outdo God. And even though we're suffering right now, this suffering is not going to last forever. There is hope. And that's the point of the dream. Not to get confused in the description, not to let the story overwhelm us and try to figure out all the details, but to simply look at this message of hope. God is going to win. Let's look at the interpretation. He says in verse 39, after he tells Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold, after you there will rise another kingdom inferior to you, then a third kingdom of bronze which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, and as much as iron uh, shatters and crashes all things. So like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all of these in pieces. And that you saw feet and toes partly of the potter's clay and partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in the toughness of iron, and as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay." As the toes and the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with the clay. They will combine with one another in the seed of men. That's the point. That's the point. There are going to be a kingdom. There's going to be a kingdom. It's going to attempt to unify itself with other types of people and it's just not going to work. Have you ever noticed certain people groups just simply don't get along? I mean, look at, look at the Middle East, for instance. It's been in war for thousands of years. There are certain people groups that just don't get along. They're just not going to mix. They hate each other. That's what's going to happen in this kingdom. 
But they will not adhere to one another, it says, even as iron does not combine with a pottery. And in the last days of those kings, this is the important part, in the last days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will last forever. And as much as you saw that stone that was cut out of that mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, and the clay, and the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to you, O king, what will take place in the future, so that the dream is true and its interpretation trustworthy. If you want to get into the history side of it, uh, we are digging deeper on Wednesday nights, and we'll talk about the uh, historical accuracy of some of these kingdoms. This is the reason why a lot of people don't believe the book of Daniel was written when it was written is because this is such articulate prophecy in history. So that's a little plug. If you want to come out on Wednesday night, we're going to be talking a little bit more in depth about this. But the point is this. There's going to be a fourth kingdom that's not going to get along. It's going to be one of the strongest kingdoms the world has ever seen, but it's going to be trying to bond with clay, people that just don't mix. And that was Rome. Historically, that was Rome. And in the midst of that kingdom... A rock is going to come down from heaven, metaphorically, and it's going to destroy all of those kingdoms, and it's going to grow, and it's going to endure forever. When did this happen? What can we point to in history that could identify it uh, with us today? Well, first of all, he says, look at verse 44, it's going to be indestructible. It's a kingdom that's not going to be left for another people. So here's what would happen. Babylon uh, was one of the greatest kingdoms of the world. And it was overtaken by a nation called Medo-Persia. Medo Persia. And so they united together. And you've seen probably 300, for instance, right? King Xerxes, one of the greatest kings of the world. They were incredibly strong. They were incredibly swift. They were a very powerful nation. Well, they took over Babylon, and they started to rule that. Well, then what's the next kingdom after Persia, right? You've got Alexander the Great, who takes over both Persia and Babylon. And then after that, Rome who takes over both Greece, Persia, and Babylon. And so what would happen is these kings would absorb other kingdoms, and they would place governors there. For instance, if you read in your Bible the Christmas story, who is the king over Jerusalem? King Herod, right? And so they would place kings over those dominions that they conquered, and they would be absorbed, but not so with the kingdom of God. No king is ever going to come in on the kingdom of God and take it over. You are not going to be abandoned, to be left, to be ruled by somebody else. The kingdom of God is powerful. It endures forever. And it, and it floods the world with its greatness, so to speak. Notice at verse 45, he says it's going to be without hands. That's supernatural. It's something that can't be physically established in Jerusalem. It's something that a physical body isn't going to come and establish in Jerusalem. It's a spiritual kingdom without hands. And this is all throughout the Bible. For instance, and I've got this up on the screen for you, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah talks about the glory of God being filled in all of the earth. And it talks about how God is going to establish this mountain that no one can hurt or destroy. One of the great prophecies about the kingdom of God is in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And Isaiah looks forward to this day where he says, now it will come about in the last days. When did Jesus come? In the last days. When was the kingdom established? in the last days on the day of Pentecost, that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so Daniel looks forward, 600 B.C., he looks forward to a new day, a new kingdom that won't have a physical realm, that won't have a physical king. And he gives this imagery of a beautiful mountain that springs forth and everybody in the entire world are welcome to it, not just the Jews, not just the Babylonians, not just the Romans or the Greeks or the Americans, but everyone in the entire world can come to this mountain. One of my favorite verses is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22. It's talking to Christians, and this is so important. You can't miss this. He says in verse 22 of Hebrews chapter 12, talking to Christians, but you, Christians, have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriads of angels. You, as a Christian, can approach the mountain of God this very day. 
Because it's not physical. It never was meant to be a physical location when Jesus came. We approach it spiritually. Look what he says in verse 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. Let us give thanks by which we may offer to God, what? A service with reverence and awe. Giving thanks and serving. Giving thanks and serving. We can approach God's mountain today and become a Christian. We can be a part of the kingdom today and serve God today and not wait for a future dispensation. That is a complete and total lie. It's something that we can rejoice in today. You know, everybody probably for about the first 1,500 years believed that Jesus brought the kingdom. It wasn't until a guy named John Darby who listened to a woman, and none of you are probably going to know who this is, named Margaret MacDonald, who spoke in tongues and gave this supernatural ecstatic utterance about the dispensational kingdom of God that was all future. But yet, for the first 1,500 years of church history, they all looked back at Jesus' birth and they said, that's when the kingdom began. And so we can't fall into the, into the trap of believing that we're not part of something bigger than ourselves today. In Mark chapter 1, verses 15, very simple. John the Baptist came and said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, it's right here. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom, for instance. In fact, Jesus said this to his disciples, truly, truly, I say unto you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see what? The kingdom of God. Did Jesus lie? Was this a mistake? And then when you look at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, verses 12, you got this guy named Philip who's preaching the good news about the kingdom. Paul said this, he testified about the kingdom of God and he persuaded people about Jesus. One of my favorite verses is Acts chapter 14, verses 22. Paul says, with much tribulation, we have entered the kingdom of what? The kingdom of God. Let me ask you a question. How do you enter something that doesn't yet exist? How is Jesus a king over a kingdom that doesn't exist? It's impossible. It doesn't make sense. But unfortunately, our culture has confused us over what is true. And one of the most powerful passages of Scripture, and you can apply this to yourself, is in Revelation chapter 1, verses 6 and 9, where John says this, He has made us to be the kingdom, priest to serve God. Think about that for a second. You are a priest or a priestess in the kingdom of God. He goes on to say in verse 9, you are fellow partakers in the tribulation and the kingdom and the perseverance which is in Jesus. You're royalty. Ladies, you're a queen. Men, you're a king in the eyes of God, in the kingdom of God. And that is an incredible position that we can hold. Well, let's wrap up this story. He's looking forward to this day when the kingdom of God will come, grasping on to this hope as a Jew who's been taken to Babylon, who has basically nothing and no family. And he tells King Nebuchadnezzar this dream, and he says, you, King Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold, but your day will come. And the kingdom after you, their day will come. And the bronze kingdom, that day will come. And the iron kingdom, that day will come. But there is going to be a kingdom which will never end. And you can imagine King Nebuchadnezzar. What? My days are numbered? I'm not going to live forever? I will die someday? Yes, you will. And look at what happens in verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, and he paid homage to Daniel. He gave thanks. He gave thanks. And he gave orders to present him an offering and a fragrant incense. And he served. He gave thanks and he served. Daniel gave thanks and he served. King Nebuchadnezzar, when he found out the truth, he gave thanks and he served. What about you? When you look at this truth about the kingdom of God, when you see what God has done in your life, what do you do? Do you give thanks? Do you serve? Are you giving thanks? Are you serving right now? You see, giving thanks helps us be Christ-centric rather than egocentric. And without thankfulness, we become so self-centered and so egotistical and so selfish. You see, giving thanks also reminds us of how much we actually do have. And I don't know about you, <coughs> excuse me, but sometimes I can tend to focus on the negative. I can tend to focus on the things that I don't have. And when I start thanking God for what I do have, just like Daniel, just like Nebuchadnezzar, I all, all of a sudden I realize that this life isn't luxury. And think about Daniel. He has lost everything. And he gives thanks and he serves. He gives thanks and he serves. You see, Daniel didn't thank God for his capture. 
He didn't thank God for his pain, but he, he thanked God for the strength to make it through. He found the silver lining. And when we start thanking God for the things that we have, we will not take things for granted. We will put things in perspective. If people ask, well, what is God's will for my life? Well, it's very simple. A couple weeks ago, we talked about not being sexually immoral, not getting drunk with wine. And then here's our third one. Giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for your life in Christ Jesus. You see, giving thanks puts things in perspective. It reminds us of how much we have, but it also reminds us of how much we have to do. And so in conclusion, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 through 16 says this. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of the lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. You know, I can't imagine what Daniel was going through. I can't imagine the pain and the hurt and the tragedy that he experienced. Losing his family, losing his home, not being sure whether or not he was ever going to go back. But there was something about Daniel's ability to find the silver lining in life and to give thanks for what he did have and where he was at. And he was even willing to allow his thankfulness to motivate him in such a way that he was willing to serve people that he was in direct contradiction with. People that took everything from him. He said, I'm going to serve the glory of God.